Good shot. Bang. Done. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Fighter Data Breakdown, a show about MMA predictions and percentages. In today's installment, we'll be looking at UFC 284, an absolute titan of a card with two belts up for grabs in some of the most high-stakes title fights we've seen in a long time. Before we start, let's have a brief look at how we did for Louis V. Spivak. For a more in-depth review of how I did in my last card, you can check out the review and results show coming out soon. But for now, we uh, will take a quick look at how we did. I thought I did a lot worse, but my overall success rate remains unchanged, and my pick rate has actually gone up due to picking two underdogs in Devin Clark and Anshul Jubilee successfully. My method pick rate still needs some work. The lightweight title is on the line as defending champion Islam Mahashev looks to thwart the featherweight champion Alexander the Great Volkanovsky's aspirations for two-divisional glory in what is going to be a battle for the ages. In the Cohen main event, we have a pair of absolute warriors who have earned their shot at combat sports immortality the old-fashioned way by carving a path of violence that ran through all those who stood between them and the gold. Top 5 ranked featherweights Yair Rodriguez and Josh Emmett are set to battle it out for the interim title. Set for an action-packed lead-up with such names as Tyson Pedro and highly touted prospect Jack Della Maddalena, it looks like it's going to be fireworks from start to finish in the land down under. So, let's jump right into it, but we'll be doing things a little differently for this installment as we'll be starting with the main event first and ending with the early prelims, just as a little experiment, see how it goes. So let's get right into it. I cannot begin to explain how childishly excited I am for this one. It doesn't even feel real to me. This feels like someone turned an argument in the comments of a Reddit post on r slash UFC into a real sanction bout. We have newly minted lightweight champion Islam Khabib 2.0 Makachev facing off against featherweight champion Alexander Volkanovsky for the lightweight championship. If Volk wins, he will be the fifth person in UFC history to be a simultaneous two division champion. So no pressure. Islam will also be facing a reigning champion in his first title defense, which is no small ask for the newly crowned champion. This is Islam's chance to start carving out his own legacy in the division and the sport, which makes Khabib's absence from coaching and cornering duties feel like a real passing of the reins. Will Islam Mahashev step up and achieve his destiny? Or will a brick wall from down under halt fate itself, snatching gold and a place in MMA history for all eternity? Lightweight champion Islam Mahashev will be going into enemy territory to prove that he can not only meet the lofty levels of greatness his mentor Khabib has achieved, but perhaps even surpass them by defending his title against men's number one pound-for-pound -pound ranked fighter, Alexander Volkanovsky. A Dagestani grappler with mountainous amounts of pressure, paired up with ceaseless takedowns and a submission game that could tap out Zeus himself. His record echoes this with his ridiculous submission win numbers. His game plan is no secret, and so far, no one has been able to stop it. Besides Adriano Martins, of course. <laughs> now, many a casual will jump to how he hasn't been tested, massive air quotes, seeing as how outside his title-winning effort, the level of competition was partially outside the top five, but I feel like this is a very unfair assertion, seeing as how he looked exactly how you'd expect someone who is levels above the top five to look against that level of competition, so I do not subscribe to that for a second. When Islam finishes a fighter, they ought to pray that the ringside physicians are ready with prosthetic limbs, because he's taking that appendage home with him. All I'm saying is that he is very dangerous on the ground. 
UFC featherweight champion Alexander Volkanovsky has gone on an unprecedented run to the top brass of the featherweight division, with goats and contenders of plenty having fallen to his onslaught. He has wins over such notable names like Brian Ortega, Jose Aldo, the Korean Zombie, and certified featherweight goat Max Holloway. Three times. He also fought a dude called David Butt. And I only wanted to mention that for the sure fact that his name is David's David Butt. <laughs> um, but I like this. I feel like it's also worth noting that three of his last five wins were against Max Holloway. But in between, he did have levels performances against the aforementioned very game Brian Ortega and foot out the door Korean zombie. Giving us some very unforgettable moments like how he escaped two submission attempts by Brian Ortega, one of which was his signature namesake finish, the triangle choke. A striker with great takedown defense and marauding pressure-heavy striking style, which reflects in his 60% finish rate, 50 of of said 60, coming by knockout finish, with a hometown advantage and the entire city of Perth on its side. Alexander Volkanovsky looks to get the upset of the ages. We have ourselves a classic striker versus grappler affair, but this one will be a classic for so many other reasons. Now, I'll give two perspectives on this one so that I can absolve myself, morally, of anyone who is swayed by my words. Firstly, I'll give the perspective of a level-headed analyst looking at the numbers and shooting straight. And then I'll go full-on just bleed and talk about how I really feel. Now, as an analyst, we first have to take note of the skill discrepancies. Volk has the striking on his side, but the difference in skill level in terms of grappling is astronomical. But at the end of the day, all fights do start on the feet. So it really comes down to who will be able to get their game plan going unhindered. Islam will have no choice but to hang out on the feet for a hot minute as he goes looking for those takedowns in order to make him tired, as Khabib would say. But that's no small ask seeing as how heavy-handed Volk is. Islam will have 25 minutes to find said takedown and have his way with Volk. But for every one of those minutes where Volk has his feet under him, he will move forward unrelentingly. So the level-headed observer in me will suggest a late submission finish for Islam after Volk put up some unprecedented defense to the wrestling attack of the Dagestani. So the analyst in me says Islam Makhachev by submission, perhaps in the third. Now, with that being said, I'm really feeling Volk on this one, man. Not because of some possible path to victory I've sussed out in tape study or whatever, but this really does feel like an unstoppable object meeting an immovable object sort of sort of thing. Now, I'm not saying Islam has bad striking at all. His striking is very, very competent. But man, I've seen him getting caught exiting the clinch one too many times. And he doesn't seem to do much about leg kicks besides catching it and countering with an overhand right like he did against Gleason Tebow. Weirdly enough, that's how Ortega caught Volk. That's exactly how Ortega caught Volk, which led to those two legendary submission attempts. So, gulp? Anyway... Islam better do something about those leg kicks because Volk has some exceptional leg kicks in his arsenal. The real question here is how will Volk be able to stop the chain takedowns of Islam? I'll personally lose my mind if he manages to even stuff one of them. If they spend extended time on the feet, I can see Volk perhaps catching him. Perhaps even coming in as he usually gets caught. But boy, does Islam have a chin on him. Islam walks through punches like it's nothing, but very intelligently does not lean on his chin as a defense, unlike certain Englishmen who will not be named. But Volk really puts the damage on his opponents, 
Look at how Zombie Ortega and Max looked in the third fight. And yeah, there I'm I'm here for violence. Okay. I'm here for the moments when the entire world loses their breath as they see a Dakistani man bleed, proving that they are human like we. This is the first time I'm doing this for a main event, but I'm going to do a championship finishers game. Now, if you'd like to find out what the finishers game is, I suggest you check out the very first installment of Fighter Data Breakdown, Strickland vs. Imovov, at the 12 minutes and 23 second timestamp. So... I'm taking Volk to shock the world and find the knockout. And in terms of uh, bets, like I said, we're going to play ourselves a mean finishes game and go with the Volk finish only, paired up with the over 3.5, and fight goes the distance just in case. So, my final verdict, give me Alexander Volkanovsky and give me Volk for KO finish to cement his place in combat sports history and become the fifth simultaneous two-division UFC world champion. Man, I'm gonna look stupid if this goes awry. In our co-main event, we have the fate of the featherweight division in the balance as striking wizard Yair Rodriguez faces the stone-handed Josh Emmett as both men look to stake their claim to the throne while the current king is out on conquest. A pair of strikers whose styles could not be more polar of each other. This looks to play out on the feet, with a chance of it ending in a concussive bang. Before we get into it though, I decided to make an adjustment to the numbers, seeing as how two of the year's first round finishes were technically not finishes and more like endings. So I decided to take them off and run the numbers again so we see what they look like. So this is what it looks like originally, and this is what it looks like after the adjustment. Whoa, look at that. Their combined finish and decision rates are literally 50-50. Interesting. Winning three of his last five with one no contest, and his last loss coming by second round knockout to MMA legend Frankie Edgar, Yair has earned his first shot at gold through a row of absolute killers, having gone to war with such notable names like Max Holloway and Jeremy Stevens. With a very unique striking style that looks to be inspired by Spider-Man himself, along with some good pressure, the majority of his wins come by striking, but he's not unfamiliar with the odd submission win every once in a while. This man is the definition of a walking highlight reel, and if he's winning, it's probably in spectacularly athletic fashion. A man who had remained in the background of the MMA game but still being very involved in it, Josh Emmett has come into the fight game spotlight after a slew of fabulously devastating finishes, demonstrating his monstrous power and dogged determination that is all coming together to both a contender of unlimited potential and the will to seize greatness in the most violently glorious way possible. With a near even finish to decision rate, Josh has proved his durability and willingness to stay in the fire against such names like Shane Burgos, Dan Ige, and Calvin Cater, to name a few. This one will clearly take place on the feet, with takedowns only starting to come in later in the fights as one fighter looks to sway the judges in what I can see being a very close striking affair. However, Yair cannot afford to try and stay in the fire that Josh Emmett will set, seeing as how he has concussive power. And with this very standard, stick to the basic style of fighting that I think is what's best for big power punchers, Yair will need to minimize the damage he takes, while Josh will need to mind his ones and twos, lest Yair turns him into a highlight reel with some of his high-risk moves like a flying switch kick or something. Yair should not lean too heavy on the flash, though. perhaps using more orthodox driving to open up for the opportunities for some of the big shots, because if he keeps going flashy move one after another, Josh will time him and take his head 
clean off as soon as his feet plant on the ground. I wonder why no one has ever tried this against him yet, but then again, I'm not a professional fighter. The pair have even finished decision differentials, so it's hard to tell if the fight will end or go the distance. Both men have very similar KO finish rates, which suggests that if this one ends, it will be by knockout. But these men are also no strangers to the championship rounds, as they've both gone 25 minutes before. This one is definitely hard to call, but for my money, I can see this fight getting extended in the championship rounds. I also see Josh Emmett using his basics to land heavy and plenty across the three rounds. Yair will be a warrior through and through, but there's only so much one man can take. Though his heart will be willing, his body would have had enough, and after a well-fought forth, his corner will call for a doctor stoppage. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm going I'm not saying that it's gonna be a wipeout because I can very easily see it being 2-2 two and two going into the 5th, even 3-1 maybe, on some scorecards, which is going to make the Doctor Stoppage a very controversial one, to say the least. But, give me Josh Everett to win by knockout and become our featherweight interim champion to set up a potential title shot against Alexander the Great. And it'll be argued incessantly if it does end by Dr. Stoppage, but um, that's what I'm seeing. So give me Josh Emmett and give me Josh Emmett by knockout late due to Dr. Stoppage. I've been hyped for this one ever since it got announced. For the feature fight of the night, we have ultra exciting prospect and owner of the most epic sounding name ever in Jack Della Maddalena will be taking the perfect step up in competition as it goes up against the rude and rowdy Randy Brown. The reason this is the perfect step up in competition is that Randy Brown is UFC tested enough and has proved that not only can he stay in the fire, but come out the other side victorious. Jack Della, whose highlight reel is the stuff of a legend, will be looking to prove his worth and move one step closer to title contention. Both men are very fluid and dynamic strikers, with Randy Brown having the slight grappling advantage. This one is set to play out on the feet in what will be a steady exchange of incredibly technical striking. Now, a takedown or two, perhaps, from Randy Brown is not out of the question, but with both men sporting overall finish rates of 70% and over, and with Jack sporting a handsome 80% finish win rate. It won't be a surprise if this bout comes to an end due to strikes. Despite the UFC experience and strength of schedule firmly on the side of Randy Brown, I believe Jack Della has the more technical and powerful striking, putting together tighter and crisper combos, as opposed to Randy Brown's more flashy and unpredictable fighting style, which works very well when he has a reach advantage over his opponent. I can see this one very easily getting extended all the way to a possible third, as Jack Della keeps getting the better of striking exchanges and stuffing takedowns. So I could either see a late finish or it going to the scorecards, but for a pick, I'm going to pick Jack Della Maddalena to stand and bang for two rounds and find the finish late in the second or early in the third. As for bets, I'd suggest the of a wine point five. Maybe the Jack Della finish only in case they go the distance. Along with a Jack Della third round or decision win to give you full coverage in case Randy Brown manages to hold out. But seeing as how Randy Brown has two knockout losses in the second, it wouldn't hurt to have some action on the second round as well. So give me Jack Della Maddalena to win by knockout and to win by knockout possibly in the second or third. For our only heavyweight bout of the night, we have Justin Badman Taffa taking on Parker Porter. Taffa is coming off his first win in the UFC with a fantastic finish over Harry Hunsucker, as opposed to Parker Porter, who's coming off a submission loss to the surging 
Jait and Almeida. The numbers on this one are very interesting, seeing as how the majority of Tafa's losses come by decision, having never won a decision victory on top of that. Porter, on the other hand, has most of his losses concentrated in the first due to strikes. So, this tells the tale of two fighters. A bad minute winner versus a bad chin. Seeing the decision success rate Porter has, I think it's safe to say he probably has the cardio on his side, seeing as how people who have terrible decision loss rates often also have pretty bad cardio, which causes their inactivity in the latter rounds, henceforth dropping a decision. So, do you count on Taffa to find the button in the first 5 or 10, or do you pray that Porter stays alive long enough to see the final bell? Porter does have the UXC experience and strength of schedule on his side, but will it be enough to hold off just to hold off just in Tafa long enough to where his power tapers off in the latter rounds? I do not think so. Seeing as how Tafa has some finishes in the second two, he will need to be able to take it into the third to stay safe, but I think Tafa will find that chin in the first or second. So give me Justin Taffa and give me Taffa to knock out Parker Porter in the first or second round. For our main card opener, we have two light heavyweight finishers of the striking variety in Alonzo Menefield and Jimmy Crute. Alonzo has been looking really good in his last five, having won four of them, with three of those five coming in the way of first-round knockout. Crute, on the other hand, has only won two of his last five, suffering two knockout losses in his last pair of outings, which is notable seeing as how these are Crute's only knockout losses. This suggests that his chin might be gone, making Alonzo Manyfield a horrible matchup due to his explosive power early and with a over 60% KO win rate in the first round. If Crouch manages to come out of the first, then the clock becomes his friend, as most of Alonso's losses come by decision. I can see why the bookies have Crouch as a favorite, though, because on paper, he is the better fighter. But with two consecutive knockout losses, I feel like he's on his way out, and Alonso Medifield will be able to find the knockout blow in the first or second, depending on how successful Crute is with his takedowns. But as soon as he gets touched, it's going to be downhill from there. So, give me Alonzo Menefield to win by knockout, and possibly in the first or second. In our feature prelim bout, we have a hometown favorite in Tyson Pedro going up against a returning to the UFC, Modestus Bukakis, who you might know from having his leg folded in half by Khalil Roundtree, which saw him leave the UFC for a brief two-fight run with Cage Warriors. Pedro is riding a nice little two-fight win streak, both in the first by knockout. Ever since his comeback, Tyson Pedro has been looking in peak form, and with a home ground advantage, I can see him extending his finish win streak to a third in a row. And seeing as how he's been looking great on the feet and how Modestus is very susceptible to the striking, I can see this ending also by knockout. But Pedro is known for his grappling, so it could go either way. So give me Tyson Pedro and give me Tyson Pedro by early stoppage. In our next bout, we have two Contender Series alum with something to prove, in Clayton Rodriguez and Shannon Ross. The pair are coming off of losses, with Shannon falling to a knockout loss in his Contender Series showing. Having never been finished, and occurring most of his wins by finish, Clayton will need to find the groove he was on leading up to the UFC with a highlight reel finish over Shannon Ross. There might just be a path to victory here for Clayton, but I feel like he will be too eager to find it. Swinging for the home run with memories of how he held back against CJ Vergara haunting him, and in doing this, might cost him, as I can see Shannon coming in tentative. 
as the last time he was knocked out was in 2012 and would not want to be embarrassed again by getting slept or tapped in the big show. So um, going hot take and saying Shannon Ross will win a very boring decision, spoiling the night of many a balanced betting ticket holder. So give me Shannon Ross and give me Shannon Ross for the upset decision victory. Next up, we got a high octane bout set to be all action from start to finish as strikers Melsic Bagdasaria takes on Joshua Koulibaly. Having only suffered one loss due to submission early in his career, which is actually very common, Bagdasarian will be looking to add a third UFC win to his record, but in his way will be the ever-exciting Joshua Koulibaly who's won three of his last five with his lone loss coming by knockout and also going to a draw with Charles Jourdain. The pair have very similar numbers in high knockout rates coupled with a total lack of submission finishes. Due to sample size, it may seem like Bagdasarian is a better finisher, but I feel like in reality he is much like Josh in how he is dead even when it comes to his finish and decision rates, which suggests that the fight might go the distance and be a very scrappy affair from start to finish. This will make it tough on the judges, but I think Josh will do just a little more to get the judges split nod, and as a result of his slight edge in strength of schedule and experience. So... I'm going with Joshua Koulibau and going with Koulibau to win by decision. Possibly a split, but um, just to play it safe, I'm going to go with Joshua Koulibau to win by decision. In our next prelim bout, we have the UFC debut of the underrated Francisco Prado. Going up against the ever-tough Jamie Malarkey. Looking for a star-making debut, 20-year-old Prado shows a lot of promise and with a 100% finish rate, it's clear that his way is the way of the highlight reel. As exciting as this sounds, Jimmy Malarkey is possibly one of the worst outs for a young and beaten prospect with a questionable record, seeing as how ridiculously durable he is. Meaning that Prado will be leaning on a puncher's chance as Malarkey will have to survive the expected early onslaught and drag the prospect into the deep waters and drown him. I can see Prado having some success in the first and possibly extending the fight, but will begin to lose the bout as soon as the second starts. Prado will dig deep to survive to the bed, with Malarkey looking better and better as the fight goes on. I can see a finish late, but I think Prado is going to hold off just enough to lose the decision. So give me Jimmy Malarkey and give me Malarkey to win by decision. In our next bout, we have the UFC debut of Jack Jenkins, who is coming off a third-round win on the Contender Series, going up against Don Shainus, a U.S. native who is one loss deep into his UFC tenure, coming in the form of a first-round submission loss to Siddiq Yusuf, so no shame there. We have ourselves a pair of strikers, which has been very common on this card, it seems. It's hard to get a good read on this guy, so I'm going to go off the numbers here. So this is my least confident pick. Do not bet on what I'm about to say. Please, please. You can do the, the other fights, but not this one, because, uh, yeah, this one just gave me weird feelings. I don't know why. But the pair combined for round one heavy finish rate, which suggests a round one or bust fighting style. Meaning that if it leaves the first, it'll probably go the distance. But Jack does have an oddly huge amount of round two knockouts, suggesting that he's a bit of a slow starter. So in conclusion, I'm seeing Don Seamus early or Jack late. But the combined numbers do add up for a huge finish to decision ratio. So I'm seeing this fast fast going past the first, but not going all the way, with Jack taking over in the second to find the knockout win. So um, give me Jack Jenkins and give me Jack Jenkins to win by knockout, possibly in the second. 
in our known women's bout for the night, we have Conclac Suspusara, but you know her better as Luma Lukbunbi, facing off against Elise Reed. Both women are coming off unanimous decision wins. The pair also share three out of five wins of their last five. But being that both of Reed's losses come by knockout, this might be trouble, seeing as how Luma Lukbunbi is a Muay Thai striker straight from the source. Loma's losses look a lot better as they are to a much higher level of competition and they are decision losses. Uh, trading decision wins for KO losses, Reed's record bolsters no confidence. And with two knockout losses in the women's strawweight division being a clear indicator of a lack of striking acumen, as opposed to Luma Lukubunmi, who has some of the best pure Muay Thai striking in the division right now, seeing as how Yohan Leon Jacek is retired from mixed martial arts competition. I'm going to listen to the writing on the wall of this one and call a knockout finish for Luma Lukubunmi. It's hard to say if it'll come early or late because. This is women's strawweight at the end of the day, where decisions run wild. But I can see a Reed takedown being stuffed and turning into a ground and pound finish for Luma. So, give me Luma Lukbunmi to win by knockout and possibly late. In what will be the second bout of the night, we have technically undefeated contender series product Blake Builder taking on Shane Sugar Young, a striker who is five fights into his UFC stint, winning two of those but dropping the other three, two by decision and one by first round knockout finish. Sporting a over 60% finish rate and 50 of let's say 60 coming by submission, it's clear that Blake has a solid ground game but Shane has never been submitted in his 19-fight career. Shane Young will be fighting under pressure, seeing as how a finish loss would make it three in a row, while Blake will be looking to show out in his pay-per-view debut appearance. The pair combined for very close finish decision rate, with all but one of his losses coming by decision. I'm going to take a shot in this one, uh, getting extended all the way, and Blake coming out on top with a decisive, decisive unanimous decision win over Shane Young. So, give me Blake Builder, and give me Blake Builder to win by decision. In what will be the opening bout of the night, we have a striker versus grappler bout mirroring the styles in our main event, with striker Zuburia Tukigov looking to foil the UFC debut of Elvis, Elvis Abrender Olivero, a grappler with some absolutely goofy submission numbers. Elvis will be looking to make a statement with a win over the eight-fight UFC veteran in Tukigov. It's no secret that Turkigov is a decisionator with some mountainous decision win rates. But what the numbers don't show is how many of those are split or majority decisions. 7 out of 15 of his decisions are split, meaning that, that close to half of them, about 46% of them, going the distance, end up being in a split decision. What's even more interesting is that most of those split decisions come to grapplers, which he won, of course. So, seeing the not-so-high-level nature of this fight and it coming in early in the card, I'll, I'll just listen to the numbers and go with Zuburia by decision, or possibly split decision. And I'm hoping that they uh, open up to what I'm hoping is a night to remember for all the right reasons of course so give me zuburia turkogov to open the night with a decision win thank you for joining me today for another installment of fighter data breakdown stay tuned for the results and recap show of ufc fight night 
Lewis vs. Spivak, which will be coming out sometime during the week. Thanks again for your time, and I very much hope to see you again next time.